This media has been made available by Mosaic Boston Church. If you'd like to check out more resources, learn about Mosaic Boston in our neighborhood churches, or donate to this ministry, please visit mosaicboston.com.
just want to thank you for adopting us into your family. Uh, we thank you for the family that we have in Christ. And we thank you that you are a good father, that you are a father who loves to speak to us as your children. And I pray right now that you would speak to us through your word, that Holy Spirit, you would use this time uh, to communicate to us all that you would have us to know from this amazing passage of scripture that we have before us uh, today. Lord, uh, pray that you would bless our time in your word, and I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. The title of today's sermon is Overcome Your Fear of the Future. Uh, how do you think about the future? How much do you think about the future. I'd be willing to guess that most of us probably spend more time thinking about what might happen in the future than we do about what has happened in the past or even what is happening in the present. Uh, we are Bostonians. We are very goal-oriented people. We have education goals and career goals and finance goals and health goals and personal goals and family goals, and then there's nothing wrong with setting goals. But how do you think about the future? Does the future, when you look, and you think about the next year ahead of you, the next five years, maybe 10, 20, 50 plus years of your life ahead, does that bring you a sense of peace and excitement and contentment and joy? Or like many of us, does the does this future stress you out? Right? You're thinking about what's coming, you're thinking about what's ahead, you're thinking about what might happen, and maybe that leads to worry, concern, anxiety, and stress, because we're all tempted to ask this question, what if? Like, what if something goes wrong? What if things don't go as I'm planning? 
What if I don't have enough? What if I fail? What if I let down the people that I care about? What if things keep getting worse? What if the government gets worse? What if the economy gets worse? What if I can't find a job? What if I lose my job? What if I hate my job? <laughs> what if I hate my boss? What if I get a bad roommate? What if I can't afford my rent? What if the people I care about move away from the city? What if I get sick? What if my child gets sick? What if they struggle with school? What if they struggle with their faith? What if a loved one dies? What if my relationship falls apart? There's just no end to the what ifs that we could ask. And it's always there. What if things never get any better than they are right now? Or what if tomorrow is worse than today? The thing is, that's a question that we've actually been commanded not to ask. Not, not literally word for word, but what did Jesus tell us in Matthew chapter 6? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told his disciples in verse 31, he says, therefore do not be anxious, saying, what do we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles, they seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Uh, there's an old motivational speaker who used to say that worry never robs tomorrow of its sorrow. It only saps today of its joy. And that's, that's true, but it doesn't really go far enough. The problem with worry is not just that it's ineffective, it's unproductive, it's that it's inappropriate, at least for the Christian, because worry denies the power and love of our Father who provides and protects. Now, when the world worries, it, it worries because it, it, it should. It's rational for the world to worry. There's no reason not to, but for the Christian, worry it is against the new nature that we have been given in Christ. It is irrational, it is uncharacteristic of the children of God, and ultimately it's, it's inappropriate because for the Christian to worry about the future is kind of like saying, God, I know that you forgave me. I'm just not so sure that you can save me. I don't know if you're really going to take care of me. Now, we might not think that. We might not say it out loud, but when we worry, when we're anxious, it shows that deep in our hearts, part of us still believes that it's true. And so how do we overcome our doubts and our fears of the future? That's what we're talking about. For the last few weeks, the Apostle Paul has been expanding on this idea that he introduced to us way back in verse 15. If you were here a few weeks ago, in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, he tells us this, that you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And that the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. If God is our Father, can we really trust that he is a a good father, a strong father, that, that he is going to take care of us. If you have your Bibles open up to Romans chapter 8, we are looking at verse 16 through 30 today. And in our passage today, the Apostle Paul, he's going to describe three blessings. You can think of these as tools or, or weapons in our arsenal, three things that Jesus Christ gives us in order to overcome the spirit of fear in our lives and replace it with a spirit of faith so that we as God's children can face our future with confidence and peace and joy and courage and hope because we know that we have a Father in heaven and we know that we are safe in the Father's hands. So if you have your Bibles, this is Romans chapter 8, beginning of verse 26, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom 
He predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is the reading of God's word for us today. And the big idea of the sermon today, it can really be summed up in one sentence. That's this, that in Christ, we have provision, purpose, and perspective to persevere unto perfection. And I know you're all tired of hearing how much pastors love alliteration, but it's just, it's there. (laughs) But hopefully it's sticky. Hopefully it helps you to remember this. Memorize this sentence, memorize this passage, memorize this chapter, because if you can get this thing, the things that we are going to talk about today, if you can get them into your mind so that they grip your heart, this will completely transform the way you live your life. In Christ, we have all the provision, purpose, and perspective we need in order to persevere unto perfection. By perfection, I mean our glorification, the final eternal state that we are destined to arrive at if we are in Christ where we will be perfected and live in the perfect presence of our God for all of eternity. And so, first of all, point number one today is that in Christ we have provision. I want you to think about your life as a journey. And the kind of journey that you're on is really going to depend on a number of things. Maybe right now your life feels like a journey that is filled with fear and confusion and anxiety, like you've just been dropped in the wilderness, you don't know which direction to go and you're trying to somehow search and find your way back to civilization. And what if I told you that your journey in life could be less like an episode of Survivor Man (laughs) and more like you're getting ready for a a grand adventure, you're going on a journey, you're heading towards a a vacation, a, a place that's gonna fill you with peace and joy and excitement and anticipation along the way. The thing that sets those two types of journeys apart are are a provision and purpose and perspective. if, If you're thinking about you're planning a journey, you're going on vacation, you have a good purpose, you have a goal, you know where you're going, what you're working toward. You also have perspective. You know where you are, you know where you're going, and you, you've got a map. You know how you're going to get there. And then thirdly, you have provisions. You take the time to, to pack your supplies, to get your, your plane tickets, your rental car, your accommodations. You've made sure that you're going to have everything you need to get there and back again. So, if we want to overcome our fear of the future, and the first thing that we need to know, and, and we need to not just know but believe, is that in Christ... You have a Father in heaven who will provide everything that you need to make this journey. Now, that that doesn't mean that he's going to give you everything that you want, but he is going to give you everything that you need. And Paul tells us that the Spirit helps us in our weakness in verse 26. We do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Did you know that God the Father always answers all the prayers of all of his children? Now, he doesn't always answer yes, but he does always answer best. And he does this through the intercession of the Holy Spirit. Back in verse 9 of chapter 8, Paul told us, you are, you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. So first of all, we need to understand what a big deal this is. That if you are in Christ, the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you. Jesus actually told his disciples that this is better for us than if he were to be here physically in the room with us right now. This is John 16 verse 5. He said, I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to to leave them, and they're obviously filled with sorrow, but he says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. You send us the Spirit to help us. Uh, Luke chapter 11, uh, one of Jesus' disciples comes to him and he asks him to teach them how to pray. And Jesus says something in response that should blow your mind. This this blew my mind the first time someone helped me connect these dots. Luke Luke chapter 11, look at verse 1. So Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he'd finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, 
teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Remember that. He asks this. Ask every day for your daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And then he immediately begins to tell them a parable. He says, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of what? Of bread. He told us to ask for our daily bread. Now he's telling us this parable about a friend who is asking for bread. And he says, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer him from within, don't bother me. The door is now shut and my children are in bed and I can't get up to give you anything. But I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he's his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever you want. Just take whatever you need. Just leave me alone. Let me go back to sleep. And I tell you, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give what? the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. That when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, we're not just asking for God to meet our physical needs. We are, and he does. We're asking him also to meet our spiritual needs, our deepest, our greatest needs, and our greatest need is the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And the point of this parable, it's not that God is this sleepy friend who shouldn't be bothered, it's that he is actually nothing like that. He is a good father and it is his good joy and his delight to give good gifts to his children and he wants to give us everything we need. He wants to give us his Holy Spirit. And so God gives us his spirit joyfully, freely. And what does the spirit do? Paul puts it simply, he helps us. He helps us in our weakness. Jesus actually called the Holy Spirit the helper. And it's this idea of something that gives strength and support, like the piers of a bridge that hold the weight. They hold it up. They hold it together. The Holy Spirit, he holds us up. He holds us steady. He holds us fast. He holds us secure. And the Holy Spirit does this in a lot of different ways, but one of the most important ways he does this is what we see in our text today. He does this by interceding in our prayers. Back in verse 26, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. You understand what Paul's saying here? In our weakness, we are susceptible to sin, we are susceptible to suffering, and even when we go to God in prayer, we don't always know what we want, what we need, what to ask for, what to say. We work with limited insight, we pray with limited information. And so if we don't know what to ask for, and if God already knows what we need before we do, then what's the point of prayer? Is prayer just a waste of time? And the answer is no. That even when we don't know what to ask for or, or what to say, the Holy Spirit of God intercedes on our behalf. And, and this is what this means. That the Spirit who is omniscient, who is God, who knows all, who is without weakness, without sin, will always pray the right thing on our behalf. And therefore, God will always answer our prayers. And even if we don't know what to say, and even if God already knows what he needs, like a good father, he still wants his children to run to him. When things are good, when things are bad, he just wants us to come and to pray. And so, I said this earlier, this doesn't mean that he's always going to answer yes to all of our prayers, but he is going to answer with what's best in all of our prayers. And the application is just, it's simple. It's that you have a Father in heaven who cares for you, who wants to hear from you. You have a, the Holy Spirit of God within you groaning, praying, interceding on your behalf. And so therefore pray. Don't let weakness keep you from prayer. Don't let, don't, when you don't know what to say, when you don't know what you need, in your moments of greatest weakness, that's the, that's the most important time for you to go to your Father because you know that you will never be praying in vain. Now, 
we might not always be able to see or understand why God answers our prayers in the ways that he does. But what this is showing us is that we can have faith that what, however he does answer us, he is always doing what is best for us. And he's always going to give you exactly what you need to become the person that he created you to be. Uh, and this brings us to point two, that in Christ we have purpose. See, what we need and what we may think we need or what we want are not always going to be the same thing. Uh, when our son Owen was three or four years old, he fell down on the playground and he got a massive, a big gash on the top of his head. And he ran to mom and dad and he cried out and he knew that he needed something. As it turns out, what he needed were stitches. <laughs> um, I don't know if you've ever been with a three-year-old thing who needs stitches. It's traumatic. <laughs> I knew what he needed. The doctor knew what he needed. But do you think he understood the purpose of what we were doing as he was being stitched up in that moment? He didn't understand anything but the pain. And yet, you know, I basically had to bear hug him pin his arms down, hold him in a headlock as he's screaming at the top of his lungs while the doctor tries to do her best to stitch up his wounds. It was extremely painful for him. It was more painful for me, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> it wasn't fun, but it was necessary and it was good to make him whole, to heal him, to give him what he truly needed. There was a good purpose in the pain, even if he couldn't understand it at the time. And see, our problem is that we often, we care so much about our immediate comfort. Sometimes it's hard for us to see or understand how much God cares about our spiritual health and maturity and healing and growth. He wants what's best for us, even when we do not know or want what is best for ourselves. And because of this, we can have faith in those moments of pain that God is working out a good purpose. We saw this earlier in Romans chapter 5. It tells us in verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God then he says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That we see there's purpose here, that our pain is not pointless, our pain is not in vain, our pain is actually productive. It is producing something of eternal value. There is significance even in our deepest suffering. And knowing this, knowing that pain has a purpose, this is vital to our perseverance in the faith. Without purpose, it is difficult to endure even the most trivial of inconveniences. Have you ever left something in your car? And you're like, I have to get up, to put on pants, tie my shoes, find my keys, go down there. Maybe I'll just order a new one on Amazon. <laughs> it's not worth it. Without purpose, we are exceptionally weak and lazy creatures. But with the right purpose, it becomes possible to endure virtually anything that we can conceive of. And this is what brings us to verse 28 of our text today. This is one of the most profound and encouraging statements in all of scripture, Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. You notice he doesn't say that we, we, we think or we kind of hope. And he doesn't say that some things or maybe a few things or certain things work together. He says, no, we know that all things work together for good. And he says this in the context of talking about suffering. Um, this week, our kids were learning about the story of Joseph down in kids' summer nights. If you had kids there, hopefully they shared a little bit about that with you. And if you're familiar with the story of Joseph, you probably noticed some similarities to what Paul says in the Romans 8.28 and to what Joseph says to his brothers near the end of that story. If you're not familiar with it, I'll just summarize it real quick. There's this man named Joseph 
or sorry, Jacob. And Jacob became the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And Jacob had a son named Joseph. And scripture tells us that Joseph was, that he loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. Because Joseph was the son of his old age, that he was the baby and he, he doted on him, he spoiled him. You know, the, the whole story of Joseph in the coat of many colors, he, he, he poured gifts out onto him. And obviously this caused problems because Joseph's gr- brothers, they grew jealous. They grew bitter and actually their, their hatred for this brother of theirs got so bad that when Joseph was around 17 years old, his brothers, they come up with this evil scheme where they are going to fake Joseph's death and sell him into slavery in Egypt. So at around 17 years old, Joseph loses everything he loves. He is taken from his family, he's taken from his home, and for 13 years he is held captive first as a slave, and then later as a prisoner accused of a crime that he didn't commit. Finally, after 13 years in captivity, we see God's providential grace has actually been working behind the scenes this entire time to bring Joseph to where he is. That he raises Joseph up out of slavery, raises him out of prison. He raises him up and gives him favor with the people of power until eventually Joseph becomes the most powerful man in all of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh himself. And it is in this position that God then uses Joseph to save the world from a devastating famine. Now, near the end of the story, you remember Joseph's brothers They're living in Canaan, they're running out of food, and so they resolve to travel, to take a trip to Egypt to see if maybe they can find food there. And of course, this is where they are reunited with their long lost brother. And when they realize who Joseph is, obviously their reaction is is dread, It's, it's fear, it's terror, that surely Joseph is going to take his revenge, he is going to have us all put to death. But then there's a a shocking twist in the story. Instead, Joseph chooses to forgive his brothers and he saves his family. And then some time goes by and eventually their father dies. Jacob dies. And once again, Joseph's brothers, they're, they're, they're fearful. They think, oh, maybe Joseph was only sparing us on account of our dad and now surely he's gonna come and have his revenge. And this is in Genesis 50, verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. But Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. This is the God that Paul believed in. It's the God of providence and of purpose, a God who picks up broken pieces and turns them into something even more beautiful than they were before. And notice it doesn't just say that what you intended for evil, God used for good. So what you meant for evil, God actually meant it for good, that he had been working behind the scenes this entire time, orchestrating this entire thing to bring this about for the salvation of many people. God was sovereign over all of it. Even in the the real choices that were being made by people along the way, right? Joseph, Jacob was making real choices. Joseph was making real choices. His brothers, Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, the Pharaoh, they were all making real choices. And yet we see that God was still sovereign, working providentially through all of it to bring about his plan. Paul believed in a God who does no evil but is able to use even evil things and ordain them to be, to work them together for his own good pleasure, his own good purposes. Now Joseph, of course, Joseph is just a type of Christ, that God was able to take the greatest evil in Joseph's life and use it for good. But ultimately, this is meant to point us forward to the reality that God took the absolute greatest evil in all of human history, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and use that for the greatest, absolute greatest good, the the redemption of his people and the glorification of his son. And now we see examples of this all throughout scripture, but what I hope for you today is that can you see examples of this in your life? Because in Christ we should. In Christ we should be able to look back on our lives and see glimpses of 
God's glory at work, bringing about his purposes, even through the painful seasons that we've experienced. Now, sometimes, you know, we'll be able to look back and it's going to be crystal clear. Like, I can see what God was doing through that situation, and I'm thankful that he did. Now, other times, it's not going to be that way. Sometimes we're going to look back and the purpose is going to be harder to see. But even when the purpose is not clear, the promise is clear. The promise remains that God is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. He used the suffering of Joseph. He used the suffering of Christ so that by faith we can now have assurance that he is working both the good and the bad together for our good. Uh, Romans 8, we saw this uh, verse last week. Romans 8, 18 says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so in Christ, we have provision to persevere. We have a father who is always faithful and will give us everything that we need to make this journey. In Christ, we have the purpose to persevere. We don't lose heart because we have assurance that nothing we suffer, nothing that we sacrifice in this life will be in vain. And then finally, most importantly, we are able to persevere because in Christ we have perspective. This is point three. Romans 8, 28 continues. And I know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose for... Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order to make him the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Uh, When I was in college, I worked in a chain factory, making big industrial chains for construction equipment and and farm equipment. And uh, I worked in a factory, it was hot, it was loud, it was hard work. Uh, Some of the jobs were fun. I got to drive a fork truck for a while. That was a super fun job. Most of the time though, I was a, a press operator. So I would sit at this large, massive press and I would just do the same thing over and over and over, thousands of times for some eight, 10 hours. Uh, in a day. It was, it was tedious, it was monotonous, it was hard work. Now imagine if at the beginning of my time there, my boss had come to me and said, hey, here, here, here's what you're going to do, and if you work this press for us, then at the end of the week, there's a pretty good chance we might pay you. <laughs> say, well, there's a pretty good chance I'm quitting right now. I'll, I will see you later. I'm not taking that chance, but that is not the perspective that I had. What I saw from my perspective was that I was going to be paid fairly to do the job that they asked me to do, that this money was going to help pay for my future, pay for my education, that that these chains were going to be installed in equipment that would build great things and go into tractors that would, you know, help farmers be more efficient and they would help, you know, produce crops which would feed people and so that there was dignity in this work and what I was doing, it mattered and it was going to pay off. And that was guaranteed. It helped me that perspective helped me to get through and keep on going even when the job was hard. And this is the point, as Christians, we have the privilege of perspective that God shows us the end from the beginning, that we already know the outcome of our faith. And so we can trust that all of our suffering, all of our sacrifice in this life is not a loss. It's actually an investment. It's an investment into eternity, and it's one that we know the return on that investment It is not just going to be potentially parabolic. It is already guaranteed that in Christ, God is giving us every provision for our journey. In Christ, God is using every obstacle along the way for our good, and in Christ, God is guaranteeing our safe arrival at the final destination. Uh, this verse has been reformed, uh, referred to by theologians uh, as the, the golden chain. Um, after working in a chain factory, that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me because gold would be a terrible material to build chains out of. But uh, uh, my son Owen was here in the first service, so I said, I'd rather call this the vibranium chain, like straight out of Wakanda. He's really into the Marvel movies right now. The point is not just that these truths are beautiful. The reason that it's beautiful is because the chain is indestructible. 
that this chain is unbreakable and there's not a single link in this chain that is, that is weakened. And so let's just walk through this link by link. Verse 29 says that for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Uh, for a long time when I was first a Christian, I had a hard time reconciling these first two links. And the reason for that was that I didn't understand a, the, the meaning of God's foreknowledge. Because most of us, when we think of foreknowledge, we think of it in terms of information, cognitive awareness, that you know certain facts or details ahead of time. And with that definition, you can understand why some would conclude that, well, therefore, this must mean that God looked into the future and he saw those people who would choose to repent and submit their lives to Christ. And then based on that information, he must have chosen to save those people. And if that's what foreknowledge means, then that interpretation might make sense. But there's at least three significant problems that we face with that interpretation. First of all, this would obviously contradict just so many verses of scripture that make it abundantly clear that we did not choose God, but he first chose us. That we did not love God until he first extended his love to us. And if God chose us based on something we did, then salvation isn't really based on grace, as scripture says. It's based on at least some degree of merit. And so clearly that can't be what Paul means. Secondly, if this is true, if God chose people based on seeing what they would choose, then ultimately, this means that we really have no hope that anyone will ever be saved. Because scripture, again, makes it clear in the doctrines of sin that we, scripture says, we are lost and we are dead in our sins. That we are so sinful that none of us would ever choose God. And that if we somehow were able to earn our salvation, if there was any chance of us losing it, then we absolutely would, like every day. Most of you would lose your salvation before your morning cup of coffee, like every single day. (laughs) But that's not what scripture says. Romans 3.10, Romans 3.10-11 says that no one is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God on their own. Uh, Ephesians 2 one says that you were dead in the trespasses and sins, but God, being rich in mercy, because of what? Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, and our trespasses made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Uh, thirdly, and most importantly, This interpretation of foreknowledge, it presupposes the way that this word would have commonly been understood to Greek thinkers, and it doesn't really take into account the way that it was often used by Hebrew thinkers, especially in the Old Testament in relationship to God. Because in Hebrew, the word know is oftentimes used, and we use it in our language the same way, to describe personal relationship. Like there's things you can know, and that's something different than saying, I know you. When the Bible says that Adam knew his wife, it's not talking about information, it's talking about intimacy. That he didn't just learn something new about Eve when he knew her, that what this is telling us is that he related to her in a deeply personal, intimate, exclusive, and covenantal way. This is why sometimes it's even used as a euphemism for marriage and for for sex. The Bible tells us that God knew Abraham. Actually, in Amos chapter 3, God says to Israel that, Israel, you only have I known. Now, obviously, God knows everything. He's omniscient. He knows everyone. But what this is saying, what God was saying was, I chose you for a special covenantal relationship, and I set you apart. This is why... R.C. Sproul in his commentary on Romans, he he actually says that you could paraphrase the meaning of Romans 8.29, not just as those who God foreknew, but as those whom for God for loved. Which kind of makes sense because remember, we're talking about the context of a father who is adopting a son. And it also makes sense because the very next thing that Paul tells us in verse 29 is that those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That God chose to love you. He chose to adopt you as his own. And because he chose to adopt you, he he, he chose to predestine you to be conformed to the image of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. 
And so off of those first two links in the chain, all the others fall into place. That those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. That if God foreloved you and chose to adopt you as his own, then he will sanctify you. He will make you like his son, Jesus Christ. And if he is going to make you like Jesus, then he is going to call you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And if he is going to call you out of darkness, he is going to justify you. And up to this point, all of these things that we've talked about are things that for the Christian have already happened in the past. We have been predestined. We have been called. We have been justified. But then Paul gets to the final link of the chain and he puts that in the past tense as well. That those whom he justified he also glorified as if it's already been done. Because in God's mind, it has. In God's mind, from God's perspective, this is as good as done. Nothing can stop it. Nothing can thwart his purpose or his plan. Nothing can rip us from his hands. And the hope of the Christian is that you have been saved, but also that you will be saved. You didn't adopt yourself. God chose you, and he chose to put his love on you, and his love for you will never fail. And yeah, God is a good father, and sometimes he may need to discipline us as his children, but he is not going to give up on us as his children. He is not taking any of his kids back to the orphanage. Once he's adopted you, you are his, and you are safe in his own, in his hands. So your ultimate security as a Christian in Christ, your hope, your peace, your salvation, it's not dependent on your ability to hold on to God. It's dependent on the Father's ability to hold on to you. That if he has you, he is going to give you everything you need to persevere and to prove yourself a child of God until Christ returns. Ephesians 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to his self as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Philippians 1.6 says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And Jesus told us in John chapter 10 that I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand and I and the father are one. And if you are in Christ, then God is your father. If you are Christ, then Christ is your shepherd and he will not let you go. He lays down his life to make you his own and then he gives you his spirit as a promise, as a guarantee that you will have what you need, that you will have the provision and the purpose and the perspective that you need to continue in perseverance until he returns. Now listen, I know that this passage, it's, it's quote unquote, you know, can be controversial. I, I know that it's easy to look at this passage and get hung up with a lot of questions about God's sovereignty and human responsibility and election and predestination, things like that. And, and Paul is going to address some of those questions and concerns in the next few chapters when we get there. But if we walk away from this text right now, primarily focused on those objections, then we've already missed the point. Because there is a question that Paul wants us to ask, and he, he tells, us to it, to, tells it to us in the very next verse. And it's a question that is just so much bigger, so much better, and he, he simply says this, if, what then shall we say to these things? If all of this is true, then what is the appropriate response on our behalf? And he tells us that if we really understand this, and if it's really gripped our hearts, then the only appropriate response is to simply say, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? 
If God is for you, and you've already won, you have overcome this world, you have nothing in your future that you need to fear, and so in Christ you can persevere. What this means is that whatever goodness God shows us right now is only a small glimpse of the glory that is to come. Whatever badness God has allowed to enter your path, he is ultimately using for your good. And no matter how good, no matter how bad things may seem or may feel right now, we have hope and we have assurance that the best is yet to come. That being said, would you please join me in prayer and then we will continue by responding in worship together. God, I pray that you would just cause our hearts to marvel at your mercy, that we would stand in awe of your amazing grace, confident and secure in your hands. Lord, every moment, every breath is a gift that we don't deserve, and yet you give us so much more. You freely give us your spirit. You gave us your son. God, all we can do is, is say thank you. All we can do is, is live our lives with grateful hearts as a response to how good you are. And so we love you, we praise you, we give you all glory, and we just want to spend time worshiping you together. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen.